Welcome everyone um, to uh, another one of our keynote meetings. I'm incredibly thrilled uh, to have Chris Leptak here. He's the director of the CDR Bi Biomarker Qualification Program at the FDA, and he will today discuss with us biomarkers and drug development from a regulatory perspective. And while aging is not an FDA recognized disease and so really falls outside of the scope of this discussion per se, he may still uh, help us answer a few questions that you may have in regards to biomarker qualification or general drug development. And he co-authored a really fantastic article on what evidence do we need for biomarker qualification. And in that, um, the, the article really argues for a really clear, predictable process for the FDA to establish which biomarkers should be accepted by the FDA. And also argues for a multi-stakeholder uh, process, including the government, academia, and industry. Uh, so perhaps you'll also be able to make a few useful remarks uh, on that end. And so I'm super excited for a really good back and forth. Um, and I will share the article that I just mentioned in the, uh, in the chat, but I'm sure that there's lots of information that came in after that article was published. Uh, so thank you so, so much, uh, Christopher, for joining us. We we're all super excited to have you on board. And uh, he'll be presenting for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll do a discussion. And as always, I'll monitor the chat. So if you want to um, if you want to um, voice something during the discussion, then the chat is really the best way to do this. And then I'll filter out and, and take you on during the Q&A. OK. Thank you so much for joining us, Christopher, and the stage is yours. Excellent. Well, thank you, Alice. And uh, just a, a quick sound check. Can folks hear me OK? Excellent. Uh, so uh, again, my thanks to Allison and for the folks at the commissioner's office that sort of reached out to me and told me about your group a little bit and uh, had mentioned the interest in the biomarkers. Uh, what little bit I know about your group, you're certainly a, a diverse uh, set. Some of you may be sort of the biomarker uh, knowledgeable. Some of you, th this may be a little bit more uh, new territory. So I apologize uh, if some of this is going to be a bit redundant. But I think for a Q&A, it's always helpful to at least set some, some ground uh, framework. Uh, so that we don't cover some basics and then that we can kind of go into the Q&A and I'll, I'll do my best to answer questions, whatever that you have. Um, so like with any FDA presentation, my normal disclaimers, if I had any such uh, uh, um, uh, conflicts, I couldn't have my jobs. That was always easy. Um, so obviously with fundamentals, we want to start with uh, as making sure that we all understand um, what we mean by the term biomarker, especially as uh, over the last couple of years, a number of uh, sort of digital biomarker journals and others have been, been populating, which use kind of a different definition than what we use at the FDA. So it's, it's, it's becoming a little bit of a challenging territory. Um, but for us, we think of it as a defined characteristic that can be measured of either a normal or abnormal process or response to intervention. Um, we think of them very broadly. Uh, I think for the, the sort of uh, lay press, it's a lot of times people think of something that's measured in a body fluid, but it could be anything from, uh, you know, a physiologic measurement of an organ or an imaging technique where you're looking at anatomic structures. Uh, pretty much anything that can be a defined characteristic can be a biomarker, at least from us, our perspective as regulators. Where we are differentiated from other groups within the FDA is it's not a, uh, an assessment of how a patient feels, functions, and survives, uh, which gets us more into the COA or clinical outcome assessment territory. Um, obviously, there are a subset of biomarkers that help to predict that clinical benefit, and those are a small subset that we call surrogate endpoints, um, but that's, that's not the biomarker field at large. And obviously, there's many, many different groups and communities that use biomarkers. We as regulators are one such, but we're not the, the, the sole use. Um, there's clinical community, there's the, uh, the scientific, et cetera. Um, and so from our perspective, when we're thinking about biomarkers from a regulatory perspective to support either a drug or a device approval, we're thinking on a population level. And that may help to differentiate it for how, say, a clinician may use biomarker information to make individual decisions for a given patient. Um, so there is a little bit of a difference there. Um, I do want to draw your attention to a resource, if you're not aware. It's in the National Library of Medicine. It's called the BEST resource. And it basically uh, was a multi-year effort that's still ongoing between the FDA and the NIH to just put forward some consensus definitions in this space so that we're all using the terminology with the same intended meaning. Um, so do draw your attention to that. Uh, it's a living document that gets updated periodically. And we're getting ready to do some updates in the near future that we've been working on. Um, when it comes to the biomarkers within that glossary, uh, the, the uh, classes that were put forward all kind of depended whether you're lumpers or splitters um, and how you approach things. We tried to organize the, the, the biomarker classes around their use um, as a way to differentiate them from each other. 
And so the seven classes are listed here. Um, I think it's in some respects easier to think about the different types of biomarkers um, through a, a flow diagram on the next page. So if we're talking about a, a given individual, um, uh, there's quote unquote normal. And we all know that for any person, normal, it doesn't mean unchanged. It just means that it's within defined parameters. And so for a given person um, throughout the course of a day or of a, a course of a period of time, depending on what the defined characteristic that you're looking at may actually change over the course of that time frame. And that normal variability is important because ultimately if you wanna say that that change is important and we wanna make a regulatory action on it, you need to know what the, the level of change is with respect to normal variability. Um, and so within this quote unquote normal state, uh, some of the biomarkers that we look at are susceptibility or risk where you're trying to predict the likelihood of development of disease in the future, even though at present you may not have clinically mean, uh, manifested uh, uh, signs and symptoms. We as organic beings, we change over time. Sometimes those changes result in altered physiology and ultimately can result in clinical disease. Um, uh, given, given the opening comment that Allison made, you know, when we're approving drugs, we do approve them based on a disease that the FDA recognizes. Obviously that, that, that group of diseases changes over time. Um, but you know, that, that is what we focus on, especially since uh, at least our program focuses on, on biomarkers to support drug development and drugs are approved for a given clinical condition. Um, so within the clinical disease, once you have that, that uh, uh, definition in play, you get into a couple more best classes, namely diagnostic, monitoring, and prognostic. Diagnostic can kind of fall into two camps. The biomarker in and of itself may be necessary and sufficient for the diagnosis of disease. You don't need any other information. We call that kind of the capital D. Um, certainly there are some conditions where that's true, but the majority of our diagnostic biomarkers are lowercase d, where that biomarker information along with other biomarkers or, or clinical signs and symptoms as a gestalt defines the disease or even a disease by ex exclusion. Um, and so that's certainly a relevant class of biomarkers to help define your patient population for the enrollment in the clinical trial. Likewise, for a condition that, that has some time uh, uh, to it, either chronic or you know, uh, more than an acute condition that's self-limited, you might want to uh, monitor a given biomarker to look for disease activity, because um, some diseases are going to uh, wax and wane in nature. And if you're going to enroll in a clinical trial, you probably are going to want to enroll uh, populations that are having active disease to see whether or not the therapy is going to mitigate that or not. And then the prognostic class is important because in a clinical trial, we ultimately want to look for clinical benefit. And so you want to go into your trial enrollment trying to enrich for patients that are likely to have that clinical event of interest within the time frame of your clinical trial. Um, if your clinical event of interest is something that may take 10 years in length, then obviously you know, the biomarkers are gonna be helpful to help to enrich the patient population and maybe even look for an earlier event than that 10, 10 year outcome. Um, when a therapy is in play, we then look at the remaining classes of biomarkers. Ultimately here, we're trying to show some evidence of engagement um, so they can be pharmacodynamic in nature. Uh, pharmacodynamic just basically says that we can say that the therapy has a biologic effect, but it doesn't say that that effect is either beneficial or detrimental. It just says, for instance, like an, a protein that we can do a receptor cell engagement. Um, and so that can be a proof of concept or looking at the, the mechanism of action of your product. Predictive biomarkers help to take a class of patients and subcategorize them to say this, this group with this particular uh, 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 feature may be more likely to have a positive effect of the therapy or more likely to have a side effect and be a safety concern. Um, and certainly we know that all of our medications, even those that are over the counter do have safety concerns. And so safety is another way of monitoring uh, the effect of a therapy on a person. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is, is change the physiology and the clinical course of the disease so that we don't longer have progression, perhaps even reversal. Um, this is when we can get into the response uh, part of the spectrum. Those themselves can ultimately become endpoints. And then, like I said, for a small subset of those that we're actually predicting the clinical benefit, those can become surrogates and become the basis for approval, either for accelerated or traditional. Uh, for biomarkers and a regulatory perspective, we always talk about what we refer to as the context of use or the COU. Um, the easiest way to think of that context of use is take your, your, you know, pick one of the best categories and then say, how is the biomarker impacting the clinical trial or the drug development program? 
So examples of that second part is in, you know, as part of inclusion exclusion criteria where you're trying to do an enrichment strategy. It may be around trying to um, identify a subpopulation of a general uh, a patient group. You may be looking at safety signals or even endpoints. Um, and what's listed at the bottom is just kind of an example of one of our, our qualifications from a number of years ago where you, you're basically trying to define how the biomarker is used so that if someone wants to introduce into clinical trial, it's very clear to them um, how it's being used um, for the purposes of, of trying to make regulatory decisions. Uh, biomarker information can come into the agency from many different sources. Uh, the drug approval process has been historically um, and remains to be the, the biggest uh, area where we get biomarker used, whether novel or accepted. Uh, and so individual companies are bringing those biomarkers in as part of their clinical trials under IND and in uh, uh, negotiating with FDA around their use and their how the data might be used. Um, there's what we call the scientific community consensus. Ultimately, this you think of it as the body of knowledge that exists on the planet around um, a particular biomarker um, in a, a system. Um, so it's the scientific community consensus includes all the publications and the scientific journals. It could be professional societies and their position statements. Um, this kind of mid category is a great place for hypothesis testing to say, here's what I think I understand of this disease pathogenesis. Based on this pathway, I think this molecule is important. I want to study it as a biomarker for this particular issue. So now I'm going to take it out of that scientific community consensus and then bring it forward either in a drug process or in a qualification program. And here's the evidence to support what that use might be. And then the, the bottom is the qualification program, um, which has been around now for over 15 years. Um, it's been formalized as part of the 21st century cure statute uh, back in 2016. I do know that biomarkers are used and information, uh, the information we look at can come from each of these. We don't have a preference uh, for any of these. Um, they're all uh, data driven uh, internally on our side of the fence. It's multidisciplinary teams that look at the information. Um, and ultimately, the uh, 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 many times we find that biomarkers are being developed in more than one of these at a time which is helpful to us because then we can look from us information from multiple sources to see to what extent they're in agreement or not. Uh, from the framework, and I think this is the paper that Allison was alluding to, we kind of broke it down to, you know, here are the elements for successful biomarker development from a regulatory perspective so that we can have conversations around those elements to kind of get you to your goal. So we start off with a need statement and here for us, it's a drug development need. Uh, one of the things that gets a bit confusing for folks that engage with us that aren't drug developers themselves is, for instance, maybe they want to uh, uh, improve clinical care. Well, that's a, a worthwhile goal, but it's not related to drug development. So it kind of falls out of scope for us. Um, that may be appropriate for a device group, for instance, if, it, if you're looking at measuring something for clinical care. But for us, we're looking at a drug development need. The context of use we just covered and then we're trying to figure out, well, what evidence do we need to see based on that context of use and need? And we're looking at the benefit and the risk to the patients, either those in the trial or those that might receive the drug if it gets approved, to then help define our evidence. And the evidence is gonna include information around the analytics or the biomarker measurement, uh, uh, the statistical analysis plan, um, basically a, a, a fair bit of information to help support that particular uh, biomarker's role. Uh, the components of a biomarker, and this is a bit of a, a simplification, but you know, in a clinical trial, there's the biomarker, there's how it's measured or the assay, there's the patient population, and then there's all the other elements of the design. Um, and as you can see by the overlapping Venn diagram, many times you know, uh, where we actually get success is that small area of overlap in the middle. Um, and what we really try to encourage is, you know, science is not, uh, it's subjective in many ways, much like medicine is. And so it's important that when you're starting out on a new effort to define what your assumptions are um, and actually write them down. Um, because if you get a negative result, you don't know unless you really did due diligence up front, what caused the negative result? Was it that you chose the wrong biomarker? Was it that you had the right biomarker but your assay was awful? Um, you know, and so forth. So, so really try to put some effort up front, clearly defining what, what your assumptions are going into your effort. And that'll help you interpret your results better. Um, around the analytics and the measurement, uh, we define them broadly into two separate buckets, analytical and clinical validation. Analytical just says you can reliably measure something. Doesn't say the measurement actually means anything. 
Um, and then the clinical validation says, yes, what you measure, you can not only do it reliably, but it has biologic or clinical meaningfulness. Um, and so that's when we're looking at our clinical data to help support the role of the biomarker, whatever its context of use may be. Um, 21st century cures uh, certainly um, uh, had a lot of benefits for us, uh, not the least of which is that it put us into a, a proactive role so that we work collaboratively with folks around their biomarker proposals um, and help you uh, uh, develop a plan that you can then execute. Um, that's a bit different than what had done previously where we, you gave us something and then we said they're not, whether or not we liked it or not. Um, uh, not terribly helpful, not very collaborative. Likewise, 21st Century Cures established a three-step process. The first thing to initiate is letter of intent from the LOI, then the qualification plan and the full qualification package, and a little bit more on that in a, in, in a, in a bit. Uh, 21st Century gave us a transparent process, um, and it also gave us uh, sort of targets and review timelines that we hadn't had previously. So on the transparency piece, as you'll see on our website, and the link is here, um, I, you'll see information from the submissions that uh, are uh, within our portfolio of the folks that we're engaging with. You're also going to see, and this is something that wasn't required by CURES, but something that we thought was important, that if we're going to have information from the outside be public, well, then our decision making should also be public. And so you'll see our decision letters and the recommendations that we're making um, to the folks that we're engaging with. And this has really resulted in a shared learning culture. So if you're developing an imaging biomarker, for instance, it would be beneficial for you to go to the website and say what other imaging biomarkers are being developed, what technologies are they using, and what, what type of information did FDA want to see. And that just makes, uh, makes your job easier because that information is already available. What we found even when the few years have been uh, this being public is that the quality of our submissions has really increased dramatically, even amongst our academics and folks that we didn't normally engage with on a significant level. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're very supportive of the, the fact that this provision was part of the, uh, the legislation. Um, for the content focus for the letter of intent, we're primarily focusing on three things. The drug development need, the context of use to address that need, and at least, you know, what is the plausible biomarker that you want to go for? This is not a data process. You do not submit primary data to this. This is also not, a, you know, an R01 grant for the NIH. This is relatively short. 10 to 20 pages tops, very focused, and it's all summary level information. Um, and so we just want to get an idea of, of, can we agree on the drug development need, the context of use, and at least that there's a body of literature out there to say that this is a promising biomarker, yes or no. Um, the qualification plan is the heavy hurdle in this three-step process because it's kind of where we really do a deep dive into the science. So we're gonna to wanna to look at the analytics and the performance characteristics of your measurement platform, um, we're also going to want to look at the study designs for your clinical validation piece um, so we can see that you're going to be collecting the information that we want. Um, and the statistical analysis plan is also a key component of this qualification plan. Um, what you're doing at, at the QP stage is saying, here's what I understand of the science today. Here's my goal. Here's the steps to get to my goal. And here's how I intend to, to sort of address those, those uh, gaps. Um, and then we kind of come to an agreement on that. And then that way you can go off and execute the plan, uh, knowing that if the data is supportive, we'll be happy and we won't be asking for more things down the road. Uh, the full qualification plan is the thing that we're most used to. And that's where you're basically submitting the, the primary data, your analysis and interpretation. And then we do our analysis and see if we come to the same conclusions or not. Internally, we have a three tiered review. Uh, the first tier is within the program. We try to look at your submission to see if it's administratively complete, um, if you're telling a clear story. Um, one of the things that we find most people do is that they try to put too much information out there, um, especially if, if you know, this is their life's work. It's really hard for them to kind of pick a day out of their life and put that on paper. They want to tell you about their whole life experience. That's great, but not helpful for us. We want to have a very kind of uh, targeted conversation around your idea. And so by adding more information actually distracts us. So we wanna keep things pretty focused. Um, after that, uh, once you have a good story to tell, we take it to our subject matter experts. They look at it in earnest. Uh, we put together recommendations and then take it to a center-wide committee that's represented of the, uh, um, the discipline chiefs. Uh, so Peter Stein for O&D is on the committee, um, uh, Issam Zanay for, Clinton Farm, et cetera, 
other designees. And so this gives an opportunity for Broad Cedar input throughout the development effort. And it also allows for us to look for greater consistency across therapeutic areas and diseases, since we have representation from so many different groups. <clears throat> uh, people are always interested in surrogates. So I do wanna to draw to your attention that there is a table of surrogate endpoints that was another CURES deliverable that's available on our website. It gets updated every six months. So do know that that's there as a resource. And then finally, if you are either a, a pharma uh, partner, uh, have an active IND with us, or you're collaborating with a pharma partner, do know that there are these new uh, type C meetings for novel surrogates that's available to you. Um, and so that's something you could explore. And with that, I thank you for your attention and we will go to the Q&A. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Wow, this was a lot of slides and uh, I already said this in the chat, but I think that we may uh, get our hands on them afterwards. So I can share them with everyone afterwards. Yes. Um, okay. And uh, would you mind if I uh, stop sharing your slide just for the moment? Uh, yeah, we may, you may hop back there, but but now we can all see each other, which, which is also nice. Um, all right, so we had Carl with his first question. And this is also just a reminder for everyone, if you want to ask a question, either raise your hand um, or say it in the chat, and then uh, I'll, 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 I'll call on you after Carl. Carl, you go first. And maybe a few words on you uh, just to give, uh, maybe put some context. Uh, so I'm Carl Flager. I'm a investor and philanthropist in the uh, longevity and aging um, space. Um, and uh, that's probably enough of what we need about me. Um, so a lot of this was about sort of entities making applications. Um, I have a sort of a ball of questions around this uh, thing. I think that is the main thing that most people here are interested in, which is um, so does the FDA like do anything to try to improve biomarkers that are used itself without any outside application? So for example, short of surrogate endpoints, what there are many different um, biomarkers that are used as um, sort of risk factors for the indications being used. Um, is there a, a, a um, formal process for approving improvements to risk factors when say a better risk factor um, comes along um, that, you know, because risk factors, for example, are important for balancing arms in clinical trials or doing stratified analysis post hoc. Um, you know, I kind of want to understand what is the process by which slowly science and medicine makes better versions of those in order to do better balancing. Um, so, and the, the example that, every, that most people here in this community are interested in is, you know, we know that age is a risk factor for many diseases, many indications for which clinical trials are run. This field has already now produced, and I see Steve Horvath on the list of participants, has already produced a um, biomarker, which is a better predictor of remaining years of life till death than chronological age, number of years since birth. So at some point, it seems intuitive that that should be used as a replacement for chronological age and doing things like balancing um, arms or at least post hoc stratified analysis of arms for any indications for which age is a significant risk factor. How is that likely to come about? Yeah, so it, it, it's a question that we get asked frequently. And if you think back to the slide where I said that we get information from different sources. So certainly when you're talking about risk factors, one of the things people are doing when they're doing their clinical trial enrollment is trying to define their population. Part of that is the risk. And it's also defining the level of disease activity. Um, and you know, we are not committed to one mousetrap and to that, that mousetrap to for perpetuity. We're always trying to make improvements. And that in the at least in the IND space, that's that the the, the person who's driving that is going to be the owner of that ID or the pharma company. Um, and so they'll bring in and they'll, they'll say, well, we know that normally uh, this disease is defined by these characteristics, but we think if we introduce these novel ones, along with the standard ones, that we're going to have an improvement in defining the population that we're most interested in targeting. And so that will come in as part of the, uh, the IND, maybe there will be a negotiation with the clinical division as part of that. In the, uh, the biomarker space, most of our biomarkers these days are composites of some sort. And the composites include demographic factors, including you know, sometimes socioeconomic or smoking status or age could potentially be one of those as well. I, I think we're maybe we're, we're not quite there um, yet around the biomarker that you had mentioned is that at least for the biomarker to come in and be used as part of some type of risk stratification process, 
it would have to be done for a therapy that is targeting a disease that we recognize. So, you know, right now, living longer isn't recognized as a disease of interest, at least not, not, not at my pay grade that I'm aware of. Um, I know there's a lot well, of interest. My question is about it all because, you know, a yes. number of diseases have age as a risk factor, even just COVID-19, right? right? So, you know, where, how do we get to the model where we use a, a, a biological age biomarker as the, as the thing that we balance the arms of a COVID-19 trial with instead of just number of years since birth, for example, right? That, that's the thing. I mean, using it as a surrogate endpoint is, is a different farther down the road thing, but it seems like this is an intermediate step. So it could be, and it could be that again, if you have you know, a particular strategy that you want to introduce age as part of your stratification for your, your, your trial, they would pr present that as part of an IND package for their clinical trials. Well, so I guess part of the question is, where does the FDA come off? A lot of times in, in other contexts for different kinds of biomarkers, not chronological age or not, not um, you know, epigenetic age or something like that. In, in some cases, the sponsor of the trial actually has an active interest in not using a biomarker that better stratifies things. Um, and does the FDA find, feel like it, ha it has a role in imposing a certain level of biomarker testing when there is a real body of science that correlates a particular biomarker with true risk for that indication, but the pharma sponsoring the trial doesn't actually want to necessarily go through that hassle of testing that, um, right. or maybe it will make their drug look le less efficacious if you had those true risk factors. Does the FDA feel like it has a role in imposing the need to use the best biomarkers available on, you know, if the, if the, you know, the sponsor isn't asking for it? Nah, not, again, at my pay grade, I'm not aware of any requirement that we can do. For instance, if you think historically, we have tried to have better uh, uh, racial and ethnic representation in our clinical trials. And, you know, we encourage that uh, to a significant degree by our former sponsors, but we still have a very, you know, unbalanced in the white male uh, clinical trial population. Um, so I would kind of put this in that same category. Yes, we can encourage, but I don't know of anything where we can mandate such a, a requirement. All right, lovely. Thank you, Carl. Next one up, I have Martin. Hi there, thank you for the presentation, appreciate it. Um, I'm a, I guess, former academic researcher into biology of aging and now, um, I run a company doing drug discovery for uh, diseases of aging. Um, and I think this is a good follow-up to Carl's um, question. My original question was, um, if you want to include biomarkers for um, diseases that aren't sort of the main focus of the trial, what are the considerations there? So obviously um, the trial sponsor has to want to do it in really what was just discussed. Um, but yeah, if you have an age, I think this is like part of the, the aging hypothesis is that uh, the mechanisms we're targeting might be impactful for more than one disease. And so you run your trial for cardiovascular events. You would love to know whether um, the drug works uh, on osteoarthritis, for example, um, like these IL-10 uh, antibodies. But I guess A, as a company, you don't wanna look bad so maybe you want to include it as a, not an endpoint or just gather the data or do you include it as a secondary endpoint? And are there any sort of legal limitations there? Not that I'm aware of, but the paradigm, if I understood it, is not, I mean, it's a common one that we already have now. So if you think of, you know, the one that I'm most familiar with when I first joined the FDA, I was in the GI division, I did immunomodulators. So for inflammatory bowel disease, well, those are also used for skin conditions, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, transplant rejection. And so initially a sponsor will come in and they'll target one disease area, but then there's an opportunity to do an expanded indication and to look at other diseases to see if it has an effect or not. So I, I, I think if I understood your question, that sort of mechanism or approach is pretty standard. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of any where they're looking at two diseases simultaneously. That, that I'm not aware of. I'm not saying that does, doesn't exist. Um, and in saying that in order for it to be approved, it'd be a, a improving both diseases. You know, I don't, I don't know of anything like that. Yeah, except NEARS, NEARS trial. Um, but uh, sorry, just one, um, I guess, addition there is, 
So the, just to summarize, the main barrier then probably is your patient selection, right? I mean, if, if you're going after cardiovascular events, you have some things in mind. Right. Um, and otherwise, it's just like, what are you willing to pay to measure? Well, and then what are your resources? So for instance, yeah. we know that for diabetes, there's a correlation between diabetes and heart disease. And it's only been recently that you've noticed probably on TV, the commercials saying, hey, not only does our uh, therapy lower your sugar, but it's also going to improve your cardiovascular risk. Well, those trials were huge and long. Um, and so, you know, it took a long time and it took, you know, a commitment by the companies to actually go that extra effort to get the claim. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Lovely. Awesome. Next one, we have Luke. This Luke, is like you are on mute. <laughs> oh, apologies. Hi, Chris. My name's Lou Hawthorne. Um, I run a company called Nanotics and we've had a, a couple of biomarker questions for a couple of years now. So it's great to have you on this, on this Zoom. So we're developing something that's best understood as um, molecular apheresis. So apheresis is a subtractive technology with an affinity column to pull pathogenic targets from blood. We're doing an injectable nanoparticle that works this, the same way, but it's injectable. So what's, what's interesting to us, and I think a lot of other people who are looking at subtractive technologies, and there's a branch of the aging community that is interested in this, is that unlike other biomarkers and other diseases with a subtractive technology, the marker is the driver. So the target you're taking out, which is pathogenic, is what you actually measure as a biomarker. And okay. you, you use an analytic technology without the clinical component you were talking about to confirm the proximal endpoint that your therapeutic has depleted the target. Right. So my question is, it kind of looks to us like we're already engaged with CEDAR for our therapeutic. It kind of looks to us like we don't really have to engage further. And anyone doing subtractive technologies shouldn't really have to engage further in a biomarker validation other than that raw mechanistic confirmation that your target depletion analytic is accurate. Does that make sense? No, I, I would agree with that. And just to be clear, uh, there's no requirement that a biomarker has to be qualified through our process to be used. In fact, the majority of ours have not. Um, this, the scenario that you're describing reminds me of some of the uh, sort of rare disease disorders, which have sort of a single mutation in a, in a pathway, and you're either having an abnormal accumulation of a particular protein, or you're having a diminishment or actually even exacerbation of a protein that's causing problems. Um, and so we have examples where therapies went in and targeted that single molecule, and that was part of the product approval um, because it was integral towards the disease pathogenesis. So I would agree with you that, you know, based on what you described, that if, if you're doing a subtractive type of an approach, um, as long as that, whatever you're targeting has biologic rationale to support its, you know, role in, in, the, in the body and the disease of interest, then that should be sufficient, provided that you can adequately measure it and you know um, provide the analytics around that. Um, and just a quick follow up in terms of our ability to measure a target, I assume that we could just forward to Cedar the um, the confirmation data from the companies we're using, like Luminex, to quantify target concentration. They've already validated their capabilities. We just forward their validation data to Cedar, that ought to be good enough, right? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. It depends <laughs> on how good the data was and how good it was collected. Like I can think of a, an example now where we're working with a, a researcher uh, at an academic children's hospital who thought they had an amazing assay, they had a partner, you know, they spent all this money. And when we finally got the raw data, the assay sucks. Uh, so um, in theory, yes. Uh, even if the assay were cleared and approved by CDRH, if the assay is being used in a drug program in a slightly different way than the device was indicated, it doesn't mean you have to start from scratch, but we may need to see some additional data. Okay. Um, but the best way to know is to you know, provide that data to us and then we can start to analyze it and see its sufficiency. Super, thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> I see, Neil, do you wanna chime in there or something? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sure. So 
Thank you, thank you very much. I, I think you kind of, uh, what we're using this session, not only for you to educate us, but for us to feedback you. And I, I think you heard some of the frustration and I actually heard some of your biases. So let, let me make two points here. Uh, when we talked about biomarkers for aging, it's really something that does two things. It distinct between people whose aging is slow and those whose aging is fast for a variety of biological reasons and also biomarkers that will change with treatment, okay? So that we can see that we can target aging and this aging that drives these diseases will prevent those diseases. This is our hypothesis. So two points, first of all, when you say here, you see that um, diabetes leads to cardiovascular disease and diabetes is also Alzheimer, that's totally false. It's the people who age faster, get faster to those three diseases. It's all through the biology of aging. It's not that there is a mechanism that connects themselves something than other than, than aging. And that's why we're frustrated. We know that, we show that. We have to stop talking like that. I, I would and disagree with that respectfully, but that's okay. I, 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 that's, look, that's, you're, that's the you're, joy of these kind of conversations. That's yeah, okay. you're not, you're not <laughs> the only one, but, but you know, unfortunately, there's a huge amount of knowledge behind what uh, what we are saying. Okay, and there's a huge, huge amount of knowledge. Another point of view too that with diabetes and cardiovascular events, there's a lot of biology to support that. Yeah, that has nothing to do with I, I would just say okay. that all, all, right. all the drugs that have proved the connection are drugs that are targeting aging. <laughs> okay, but uh, but le okay. let's leave it alone. I I understand that we're not going to agree on that, but I just want to tell us. Thank our you. But the right. second point. But the second point is that um, when, when you have this, this beautiful scheme that's saying, you know, uh, there's a physiology and we have to, to um, target the physiology and we have to show an effect, a lot of the biomarkers that we are having are not necessarily the physiology, okay? When we have epigenetic marker, we have clocks um, they might change when we treat aging, but they, that doesn't mean that they're the mechanism that we targeted. Uh, that. When we have proteins that are changing uh, with aging, um, we can treat aging and change the protein, but it's not those proteins that are causing aging. So when it comes to aging, we have to think a little bit differently than, than the silos we grew up and the disease we grew up with. No, I, I don't disagree with that. And a number of years ago, there was a, a, a cluster that was sponsored in NIH for folks that were interested in aging as well. And, and there is an openness. And, and I think I mentioned this, uh, not, not today, but uh, so for instance, we now have a handful of approvals in the oncology space where the indication is not for a specific disease, but, but it's for a biochemical pathway. And that pathway is shared amongst many different oncologic tumors. Um, uh, and so the, the indication is that we actually lower or affect this pathway rather than a, a given disease. So maybe down the road, aging might be some approach to that, that if you can target a given pathway that maybe has multiple outcomes um, and we know we can show that there's clinical benefit from targeting that pathway, maybe that would be a way of, of addressing this. I, I don't know. Again, this is way above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Neil. Next one up, we have Marty. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Marty Edelstein. I co-founded a company uh, that designs and manufactures products based on self-assembling molecular building blocks. And my question is much simpler than the previous one. Uh, <laughs> you might have this to the previous guy. That's the joy of these kind of big <laughs> <laughs> uh, In your database of molecular Molecule-based biomarkers, do you differentiate in any way cell-bound molecules versus soluble molecules? No. If it's, if that it, was easy. Easy if answer, it, man. If it's a defined characteristic, it's a defined characteristic, whether it's free-floating or bound to something, that's okay. Okay. Well, that was easy. Great. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Jean. Hi, Chris. Hey. Um, yeah, I work... Uh, I. I uh, run a lab that's focused on using tissue engineering approaches to repair uh, brain damage and reverse uh, brain aging. So um, my question is also much less procedural and 
more focus. And I'm wondering if you're coming across more uh, sort of non-invasive imaging techniques uh, as biomarkers. So, you know, especially, you know, I, I'm familiar with what is available for the brain and we all know, you know, you can use MRI to diagnose demyelinating diseases um, and PET scans for different things in the body. But I mean, more and more the, the light-based uh, imaging approaches are becoming more powerful with you know, red shifted light to look deeper into tissues. And um, I'm wondering if you're coming across more of these, particularly for the brain, but also, you know, likely for the skin and maybe even other organs. Yeah, I mean, early on, you know, in the program 15 years ago, it was mostly soluble markers that, that uh, were, were studied. I would say now, if I looked across our portfolio of, you know, 70 some programs, I would say at least half of them are imaging of some type or form, um, in large part because uh, for some diseases, trying to get access to tissue in and of itself has a risk and cost, you know, like liver biopsy is an example. And so rather than looking histology of liver features on you know, a, a slide under a microscope, they're trying to look at features through either elastography or MR mammography or something along those lines. Um, around uh, uh, any type of brain, you know, and traumatic brain injury, people are looking at CT and uh, uh, MRI features for um, axon axonal shearing and other um, anatomic structures associated with uh, the, the, the cells. Um, even in psych psychiatry, one of our programs uh, in our portfolio is looking at uh, an uh, EEG uh, signal called the N170 as a way to help to differentiate uh, within um, uh, psychiatric disorders, a, a sort of homogeneous patient population. Um, so there's certainly an openness to those. Um, I know that even in the psychiatry space, some people are looking at functional MRI as a way. The, some of the challenges around that is when you're thinking of, of imaging in particular, just because of the cost associated with it, you have to think of the practicality of a clinical trial and disease that you're targeting. If you're talking about a clinical trial that you know normally would enroll 1,000, 10,000 patients, if you're doing PET scans, what's the likelihood that a pharma partner is going to use that on every person in that trial? Probably pretty small. Um, so do kind of think about the practical piece when you come to the imaging. Yeah, in model uh, animals that we use for study, I mean, we have these miniature laser two photon cameras that you know even mice can run around with. So they're pretty small, they might be you know, much cheaper than, than these big MRIs, right? And they're light-based. Right. And, and you don't have to penetrate the skull necessarily uh, uh, to get a lot of information. So anything like that yet for humans? Not that I've come across, no. Um, nothing comes to mind. Okay. Well. Um, but maybe in devices, you know, um, the, there's things out there now for uh, um, uh, depressive disorder and things that are not drug therapies, but, but a device. I don't yeah. know if they've encountered anything like that or not. Thank you. Doesn't mean we're not open to it. Yep. Well, maybe John, you'll be the person to introduce it. <laughs> uh, okay, next on we have Maria. Hi, my name is Maria Konovalenko. Um, I uh, recently transitioned from being an aging researcher into venture capital. And I have a hypothetical question. So imagine you um, started a company and you want to do something about aging. Right now, because aging is not recognized as a disease, you need to develop a drug against a certain recognized condition. And you could uh, develop biomarkers for that condition. But say you want to do something about aging, then you are facing kind of a chicken and an egg problem, right? Because one of the ideas is um, let's create a set of biomarkers of aging and describe aging in using the language of biology. Like this is what aging looks like in terms of changes of certain biological parameters. Right. But because aging is not a pathology, people are forced to be taking these kind of side routes, right. but they're not getting where they actually want to go. What would be your suggestions? 
I don't know. Uh, I mean, this kind of came up with that NIH meeting a number of years ago that I mentioned. Um, uh, and unless something changes around our statute, you know, uh, we're kind of restricted to to kind of focus within the swim lanes as they're defined around disease. Um, now, uh, obviously, we approve drugs based on clinical benefits. Uh, so, you know, in, in part, I, I think it's going to be almost like a societal lobbying effort in a way to say that living longer is a benefit, uh, and therefore that should be recognized. Um, but beyond that sort of fanciful kind of uh, um, sort of lighthearted response, I think your best bet is to, to look at diseases that are a part of aging and try to target those. Um, and then much like to the previous gentleman's question, then try to do an expanded indication into other age-related diseases. Um, whether or not that gets you to where you're ultimately wanting to be, maybe not, but it's at least a stepwise approach in a paradigm that already exists. Um, the question would be whether or not your therapy affects a given disease within those that are associated with Asia. Got it, thank you. Lovely, thanks. And uh, next one up, we have Lynn Cox. Hi, hope you can see me. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. That was incredibly informative and I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, but I'd like to follow up some points. Uh, it, it crosses over what Nia was saying earlier. Um, Salsenescence is known to be a hallmark of aging. It is also known to underpin multiple different age-related diseases. So removal of senescent cells also improves health. And if there is a biomarker for removal of senescent cells, would that be something that might get approval if you could associate it with a specific disease? And then the follow-on from that is you've, you've just mentioned about expansion to other age-related diseases. So what we can see in mouse models is that these markers are general they're relevant to many many different diseases so do you have to go for specific disease indications for a biomarker and then gradually expand it and at what point might it be possible to term it a biomarker of aging rather than a biomarker of a specific age-related disease sorry that, that that's quite a rounded <laughs> thing no, but no. can can we address specific hallmarks of aging rather than going for a disease yeah, so, so to your first point, if you're looking at, you know, senescent cells as a, as part of the causative pathway of whatever disease is, and you can say that if you uh, impact those cells in whatever way it is, and then you can show that for that disease of interest, there's a clinical benefit that can be seen or witnessed, I don't see that as, as an unreasonable paradigm to, 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 to at least have a conversation around. Um, I mean, many times we're kind of targeting downstream effects or, you know, most of our diseases are going to be multifactorial and multi-ideology. We're not targeting all pathways, we're targeting a, a single pathway. Um, and so I don't see that what you described as being that much different. Um, in terms of taking a marker of that cell um, and applying it to a given disease, one of the things that we're always kind of wondering in the biomarker space is what is its generalizability? And, and I'll, I'll talk about, you know, safety as, as an example of that. Uh, when we're looking for off-target effects on organ toxicity, um, and they're developing a panel of novel safety biomarkers to either augment or replace our current standards, uh, it's being studied under a limited number of mechanisms of action that are known to have that safety signal. And so then the question comes, well, are we only going to restrict it to those mechanisms of action, or do we understand enough about the biology to say that even for a novel mechanism that we don't yet know, it's likely that the safety signal would be beneficial. Um, and so it all kind of gets down to the understanding of the underpinnings of the biology. Um, and so I would say for your, your example, if you can show that this particular uh, uh, senes senescent cell is integral to multiple different diseases and you have a biology biomarker for that cell, I don't think, initially you might want to target one or two of the associations, and then, and then from there, you could probably get generalizable claim beyond that. Okay. So there is scope for expansion. I think so, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Sure. Lovely. Great question. Next one, we have Robert. Thanks, Allison. Uh, and, and thanks, Chris, for the, for the presentation. I, I had a uh, kind of a comment, but, but also uh, a question, too, about 
the use of surrogate trial endpoints. And, and I mean, you, you bring it up in the presentation and I think, and, and I'm, I'm doing work kind of going down that pathway already through the clock foundation with, with Steve Horvath using epigenetic clocks. And, and then also with a treatment uh, focused on thymus regeneration, focused on kind of preventing immune system aging uh, through, a, through a company developing a cocktail of drugs. And, you know, and I think that to me is, is the most direct approach that's, that's there at, at FDA today for, and, and that can be used for any longevity drug, any longevity treatment and, and kind of what we're, what we're describing as kind of epigenetic clocks or these uh, biomarkers of senescent cells, or I saw Keith Comito talk about like an imaging biomarker of, you know, a visual analysis uh, that, that could be like a putative surrogate trial endpoint to approve a, a drug you know, for aging and preventative medicine. And, and I think that the just, I think, uh, you know, that language around kind of, you know, what we're doing is maybe some of the frustration you heard from, from kind of near, right? Like we're developing drugs uh, for the first time, you know, kind of for aging and for preventative medicine. And 20 years ago, when people thought about that, there was only diet and exercise, right? It wasn't really a drug like metformin or rapamycin or this, this drug cocktail for immune system regeneration, you know, but now there, there are actual drugs we want to use for aging in a preventative setting. And so we want to use them in a healthy population. And, uh, and, and I think kind of one of the challenges is that there is no division at FDA for that, right? Like, you know, there's no, there's no division for preventative medicine. Right. So like when we have this drug cocktail, we go to the, the endocrinology division because just that's a natural fit for it. And, and then I think these other you know, drugs have to go into, you know, it could be cardiovascular disease or, or, you know, some other completely different one. But really what we all want to do, you know, is, is more target aging directly, right? So, so I mean, I, I guess that was my, a general comment. You know, one, one question I have for you is about Kind of with a type C meeting, which is the approach we we kind of like, uh, do you get involved with that too, or does like the division handle it on its own? Like, at what point do you get involved? No, no, actually, it's our group that's in charge of those types of meetings. Uh, the the requests go to the division, um, but we're the ones that uh, created the background material of what content needs to be included in the meeting request. Um, and then we actually uh, uh, work with the divisions and then take it to that, that center-wide committee that I spoke about. Um, and in that case, the committee is advisory, um, but it's a, a, the Padupa commitment for those types of meetings that it needed to have supervisory inputs. And so that was our mechanism to allow that to occur. Um, but do know that for the type C meeting, like I'm guessing if you're already engaging with the endocrine division, then you have some IND for some disease. So you've kind of, gone over that hurdle. So that question goes aside. Um, and so then you can bring forward your idea as part of that types of meeting process. Uh, yeah, we, we do have an IND, although we didn't file it for any given disease. It was just kind of for the, the you know, the, the drug cocktail kind of, yeah. you know, to put it on file for a trial. Right. And then to your, your comment question, what's like the example that I gave with the NIH, uh, at that particular day long meeting, you know, we had our division directors for oncology, for nephrology, cardiology, neurology, basically all the ologies because disease, you know, aging, there's a likelihood of developing many different diseases as we get older. Um, so it pretty much covers the, the gambit. Um, and it's, it's tough, like what you said, to kind of have those conversations, even that conversation, which, you know, we were all around the table, there were different points of view. The one thing I haven't heard today that I did hear at that meeting that I, I, I think is a good thing is that people were, when they were trying to do it, think of what the clinical trial might look like for aging of multiple disorders, they were saying, well, we're gonna look at the, you know, of our, the folks that we're gonna study, how many of them developed, you know, cardiovascular outcomes, how many had oncology outcomes, et cetera. And they were lumping them all together. And the likelihood that you're gonna see enough of a blip of a change in one of any of those was the, the, the trial would just be huge. Um, and so I think it's better to kind of keep things simple in that regard. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have Keith. Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, great talk. Um, I'm the president of Lifespan.io, which is a leading nonprofit that raises funds and awareness for research on aging. 
And I'm also a tech lead of the advanced research team at Disney, which spearheads projects that all I can okay. say are, are not unrelated <laughs> to some of the things we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> as uh, Bobby was referencing earlier on the subject of imaging based biomarkers, um, there's some data that's, that's very, very trivial to collect like uh, facial headshots and vocal recordings that can be used to create you know, surprisingly useful biomarkers for not just age, but certain neurological disorders like Alzheimer's. So my question is, given that this data can really be collected trivi trivially and you know, basic machine learning can be used to make sure that the data that is collected is like normalized and you know, passable and uniform, what would it take to have you know, the FDA or whatever mandate that the collection of such data becomes like a required component of any trial so that this data could always be looked at later to see if there were secondary, you know, effects on secondary indications like aging. It seems like a very low-hanging fruit that would be very trivial to like systemically wide implement. So I'm just curious, curious on your thoughts there. Anytime you're thinking about uh, sort of FDA, you know, trial-wide FDA requirements, I just, I, I personally don't know of a, a mechanism for that. Uh, am I still there, by the way? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's going blank on my for some reason. Um, I don't know of any mechanism for that. And, and my guess is the pharma companies are certainly not going to be happy to, to bring in that additional data collection given the expense of clinical trials already. Yeah, I mean, my point here is that it's, it literally costs nothing if you do it right. And so I guess my question to you then would be, if, there, if we know that this would be a good thing, what do you think may or may not be like an, a successful strategy for, for how could we advocate? What's the right levers that we should try to push on to make something like this that's totally technologically trivial right. and would be good? How do we push for it? <laughs> I, I don't know. The, the, one, the one positive I can share with this is, is we are looking at things much like what you're describing. So for instance, an autism spectrum disorder, eye tracking, is one of the things that we look at. And there's ways to, to actually watch whether or not an individual is actually looking at a person that they're speaking to. And that's a biomarker that's under development for Alzheimer's, you know, um, uh, ASD. Um, and so, you know, the openness is there. I think your hurdle is the other problem of, you know, yeah. which, which disease are we going to target and how are we going to convince pharma companies that this is to their benefit? Well, as a very specific example here, I can't get into details, but let's just say that some very accurate vocal voice-based biomarkers are existing in the world right now for COVID-19 right. that could help shut this thing down. And it's very hard to try to get traction for these things to move through the system in the existing way. And that seems like maybe with the current situation, if there's a lever there to pull, like this is, in my opinion, a very extreme case where the technology, if this was implemented, uh, we'd be able to solve this thing. Like, I mean, your mechanism there, if you're thinking of this as a diagnostic, you know, you have CDRH, whether or not they're open to that, I have no idea, but. And maybe there's an emergency use authorization kind of tricks to pull or whatever, but anyway, I'll stop yeah. talking. <laughs> <laughs> we're, at, we're at the time and, you know, Chris, I can't thank you enough for uh, granting us this hour. I can't thank you enough for like taking all of those questions. That was like, um, yeah, you know, quite the, um, Quite the how do you call it? like yeah quite the um quite the plethora of questions that were launched at you thank you for taking them so gracefully I re really 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 appreciate it um, yeah, I enjoyed the conversation and and you know thankfully our regulations allow a lot of flexibility but there are some things that are are just tough for us and you know the disease is kind of one of those I think um, and I know a lot of people are certainly have an interest in that and my 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 best bet is much like I've said, that's above my pay grade kind of thing, focus on the people who it's not above their pay grade um, and kind of convince them that this is a worthwhile endeavor and figure out how to make it happen. Specific suggested people you're referring to there? I mean, think of the people that have power. <laughs> <laughs> not me, <laughs> but I mean like commissioners, secretaries, you know, folks in Congress, you know, whoever you can think of. Yeah, thank you so, so much for joining and thank you for sparing this uh, really great um, uh, yeah, project. And thanks for, you know, really trying to make this multi-stakeholder uh, project. And yeah, we really, really thank you for your time. It was uh, very, very, I think, informative for everyone here. Yeah. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll follow up with you about the slides. Sure. And yeah, thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Good to meet everybody.
Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. <laughs>